Um, if alpha is the class of uh, a meridian mu, so mu a meridian for L. And so what do I mean by a meridian for L? Oh, well, like one way to say this is that it's um, um, mu is isotopic to um, uh, isotopic onto uh, the boundary of S3 minus neighborhood. Um, Pardon? Neighborhood mm. And um, this is not quite enough because there are various curves on that boundary for us. Well, but we know, we, we know, I mean, we know what we're doing. So I'm Let's avoid reinventing the wheel for the moment. Anyway, it's, it's coming from the obvious thing. You take a curve, the torus, which generates the first homology. And um, there are sort of a bunch of these, and you can see from the picture, there are a bunch of these. Any, any meridian, I, meridian I could take um, would give me a meridian element in the fundamental group. And they're all conjugate, because we can slide one through our diagram and at each over the same component. So the same component of the link. Good point. That's a good point. Okay. Um, then the original rank of a knot group or a link group is a minimal number of meridional elements required to generate a group. Okay, and we'll denote this. Actually, maybe we'll just that's great. Um, and we can, I guess, let's just contrast this. Um, contrast with the rank of pi one of S3 minus neighborhood L, which may be write as the rank of L. Um, which is the well, it's just the rank of the group. I need to I need to find out the rank of the group. Is. Okay. Um, cool. So um, let's see. So one thing that we don't know. Uh, immediately is the following fact. Proposition says which I had the phrase by um, this fact. We've, we've seen that every link can be generated by those meridional elements, in, in fact, in this bridge sphere, uh, in such a way that half of them, that they become equal in pairs, and so we can at least reduce it to, to B of them. Okay. Um, and so an exercise is to find for um, so this has a pretty nice presentation that you can write down. Um, and you can contrast this with an exercise from, I think, maybe the first day of class or the second day of class, when you calculated a presentation for the torus link exteriors 
coming from the, the fact that it lies on a, this torus in X3. In which case, so you guys remember when you did that exercise, how many generators did you get in that case? Two. Yeah, so, so it's definitely a fact that the rank of the group of the torus is two. And what we see is that the, the the original rank of the torus now, because we know the bridge number is at most the minimum of PQ, which in general can be a lot bigger than two. Um, okay, so the reason this is such an interesting thing to think about is the complaining one more thing. No, please. So, uh, do you only need two generators even if it's a link? Um, yeah, I think so because you can see it as oh, um, you can still write the exterior as the union of two solid tori um, along a bunch of parallel annuli. Okay, and the values I wasn't sure. I think, I mean, that was the exercise. Yeah, actually, then another way to think of it is um, yeah. okay. No, but thanks. So the original rank conjecture, which is quite a famous problem, it's on the on the Kirby problem list, number one point one one, and it's attributed to Jensen. And this states that. Uh, for every link, we have equality. The bridge number of every link is equal to the original link. And this conjecture has been verified in a number of cases, which are some of which I'll highlight here. Just to give you an idea. So, so oh, so the, the conjecture holds if uh, the original rank of L is two. Um, now let me confuse myself. Is it the same as saying is it the bridge number? I guess it's probably the same, at least a posteriori. Um, and Wallow Zisheng. Michelle Wallow has put a lot of a lot of work into this conjecture over a span of almost 40 years. So it holds if L is a generalized the sequence now, link. Whatever generalized means and whatever modulus means. I guess I haven't defined either of those things. Interesting that there's another result, uh, the Lustig and Mariah from later 1993, which is actually the exact same statement. If L is a generalized modulus link, for some other notion of the, what a generalized link is. <laughs> And this this one's behind a paywall, <laughs> so I don't even know what they mean. This one you can you can look at a picture of kind of something that you you can look at a picture of what they mean by just It's fairly robust. You get just like lots of tangled. Anyway, um, so same result. Um, and then right, Zishang uh, in. Seven showed it uh, for porous links, 
Okay. So that's pretty interesting, right? So we know the original rank of a torus link and we know the rank of the torus link and they're very different. And then, so the last one is, I'll put up here because it's more modern work. Oh, I didn't write down all of the authors' names. Um, but they study the case when the exterior of the link um, contains interesting uh, essential torus. So is a, a graph. So, and they have some results about how this conjecture sort of behaves under connected sum and various satellite operations and stuff like that. So that's sort of what's known. In general, the conjecture is open, but I don't know, this seems like pretty good evidence that it might be actually true in general. Um, so there's a rank genus conjecture for Hagar splittings, which is sort of like upstairs equivalent of this, not a chance of being false. So maybe that's good evidence that this could actually false. Any, any questions? So yeah, it's things if in that piques your interest, uh, let me know and we can talk a little more about the details of some of those papers. But that uh, essentially concludes what I wanted to say. Oh, I guess I was going to oh, uh, say. That basically concludes what I wanted to say about bridge splittings of knots and links. So let's go on to part two of the class, which is bridge trisections of uh, surface links. surface can be knotted inside four-dimensional space. Okay, so where are we going to be living now? We're going to be living in a sphere once again, but this time upper dimension. So let's consider that the four sphere, which I want to think of presently as a four ball union, maybe another four ball with the opposite orientation. Okay. So often the way we're going to think about this is that the We'll, we'll regard the blackboard is the equatorial the equatorial S3 here, and we sort of have a four ball coming out in front of the blackboard, maybe, or into the future of the blackboard, and we have a four ball going into the past of the blackboard, and um, that gives us sort of our four dimensions that we have. Well, a couple of different ways of thinking about four dimensional space before the end. Um, okay, but having mentioned our sir, we can define a surface link. It is a smoothly embedded. Closed uh, two manifold S in S4. I go back and forth with what I call these things. Sometimes I'll call them knotted surfaces. I think surface link is maybe the most appropriate one. Um, the surface knot, so what is the surface knot? Well, it is a connected surface link. As with, um, oh, I guess I should define, well, so, um, we 
we will now call knots and links one knots and one links. Okay. So now, now we have to be a little bit, well, we don't really have to be very careful, but um, I, as, is, as is evident, I would worry about these things way more than I should. And so um, I will try to say things like a one knot or a classical knot. That's probably not a good thing to say. I won't, I won't say that again. Um, anyway, just like we had with one knots and links, a one knot is a connected one link, a surface knot is a connected surface link. Um, okay. Um, a surface link where uh, that is uh, homeomorphic as a two manifold to a union of of two spheres um, is called a two link, and a connected two link is a two knot. Okay. So the case of the case of knotted spheres kind of takes precedent here. Um, especially sort of conventionally in the literature and stuff, a lot of a lot more effort has been put into studying knots and spheres or uh, links of spheres and knotted spheres in force space than surfaces in general. And so sometimes it's useful to distinguish these two things. Okay. Do you really consider a surface link? So you have an orientable component and non orientable component. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's very, very much worth pointing out. So yeah, and I should probably just mention something about classification of surfaces as basically being something that I'm sort of going to assume people are familiar with, but there's a classification of, of two-dimensional manifolds, closed two manifolds, into orientable and non-orientable, um, and there's a classification, you know, there's a nice list of surfaces in each of these classes, and our surface links will be unions of these guys, of any sorts, sorts of pieces, right? So, so, for example, we might have some S in S4, where S as a two manifold is, is homeomorphic to, let's say, um, say RP2 connects on itself, the pine bottle, uh, together with a, a torus, together with a pair of spheres. Just a silly example. But thank you for bringing it up, that's a good point. Any other comments? Yeah, and in terms of like what we'll really be studying for the most part of this class is it'll usually be things like maybe I, mean, I don't know if this is really something I should say, but probably usually what we'll be interested in is like a sphere, maybe a link of two spheres. We might find be interested in our twos, and maybe tori. Um, and that's for the most part, those are sort of the interesting. We won't spend a lot of time thinking about not at genus 17 services. But maybe that's okay. Um, so uh, and we got a we want an equivalence relation on these things up to ambient isotopy. So we consider those things. Up to ambient isotopy. In other words, can we smoothly deform our four-dimensional space uh, so that we take one of these guys onto the other? So an obvious first invariant we have, which can distinguish surface links, is the number of components, which we had in the classical case. You know, a, a two-component one link is never isotopic to a, a one knot. But we also have the homeomorphism type of surfaces, or the Euler characteristic. Um, and um, right, so in the past when I've talked about ambient isotopy, I've also sort of mentioned that um, we can also consider like tipping amorphism pairs. So one thing to note is that if S is, maybe I'll write something for isotopic, maybe I'll write equals, S is isotopic to S prime, then there's a diffeomorphism of pairs, 
s bar s is dipping a little bit to s bar s prime. Um, however, the converse is not known to hold. I think this is right. Maybe Dave can tell me if I'm missing something out here. Converse is not known to hold, and the main reason is that we don't know, um, so there's an open question, which is, is the, the group of orientation-preserving diffeomorphism of S4 connected? So what you'd like to be able to say is, if I have a diffeomorphism taking one surface link to another, I'd like to be able to isotope that diffeomorphism to the identity, and then that would give me an ambient isotopy relating to two surfaces. So you can do this in, in three space because we know that diff plus of S3 is connected. Um, but I guess this is still open. And to my knowledge, there's no way to get, the, I, don't, I don't know if you can get the converse to this statement with that place. Like a priori, you could, I don't know. I don't know if that's known or not. Anyway, so to be so to be careful now, we'll definitely be working um, up to ambient isotopy. Although I guess you can say things like a, a pair of surface links are different more as pairs, but um, you're, that's not the same as saying they're equivalent surface links. Uh, you would give you a, a different equivalence relation after it. Okay. Cool. Any questions on that? Okay, so my plan is to spend the first day or two that we're talking about surface links, focusing on sort of concrete examples, and then move into a more sort of systematic way of, of studying them. Okay. So first example, maybe the one annoying and complicated thing to over here also is that not the class group of the surface itself might be non trivial it's most likely non-trivial hybrid. And so you uh, when you ask is a surface is S isotopic S prime, are you thinking of S the subset or S as an embedding yeah, of torus? It's... And if you think of it as embedded, let's say it's a torus, you think of it as torus embedded in, you could just take the exact same image but embed it, you know, embed it in differently. And you have to decide whether you want to consider those. You probably want to those like topics. So it's probably not worth writing anything down. But well, I think it's worth writing. writing like this, is, the, the, what you're saying, I think, is less of an issue because actually, for you, there are sub manifolds. There's sub manifolds. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what Dave is saying is we could we could define a surface link to be and embedding. This is this is maybe the more classical way of, of doing not things. You could define it to be an embedding of some abstract surface um, into S4. In which case, then you're actually talking about isotopy embedding maps, isotope, uh, isotopy of the map. And as Dave is pointing out, if this if the surface is as say has a genus, has an, then you could have non-isotopic embeddings with the same image. And so, yeah, that would be very annoying. Which, so I, I think it's, um, I think what you're doing is saying it too. I think it's worth trying to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's an interesting question, like, you embed a torus, well, maybe can you move that torus off itself, move it all around S4 and come back, so that say meridian flips to a longitude. Yeah, and I do remember reading at some point someone who had considered the um, considered embeddings of the torus like this up maybe not mm -hmm. uh, but I don't remember what the result was. But it's it's something we could look up. Okay. Okay. So let's consider um, a wedge of G circles. In S3. Okay. So, how many do I like this? I'll do three. Okay. So, 
wedge of three circles in S3. And we can let um, H be of W as a submanifold of S3. Okay, so what does that mean? I mean we sort of thicken thicken our wedge up so that it's a nice compact three manifold. And we call that a H and solid. Um, so this is a, this is a two way. Um, H is called the genus G on the body. Which is a very important object, obviously, or as some of you probably know, in their trisections, and one that we're not really going to say a whole lot about right now. We'll talk more about when we start talking about Hager splittings. But, um, but for now, I'm going to use it to define an interesting, or rather, an uninteresting sort of thing. Um, let's let S be the boundary of H. Okay, so, so S is the surface. It's the genus G surface, I guess we sometimes have to say G, and it's sitting inside S3. Okay. But of course, if S is in S3 and S3 is in S4, then we can look at S as being a surface in S4. Okay, so it's a surface map. Okay. Um, but actually, it's sort of a surface unknown because this is the definition of what it will mean for an orientable surface not to be unknotted. And an orientable surface link is unknotted. Oh, it's sort of bothering me. It's kind of a weird thing to say. Call a link unknotted. So why do we do that? Orientable surface link is unknotted. Or maybe I should just try to say unlinked. Maybe unlinked in general, unknotted in the connected case. I think the right advice is just to tell me this one. Um, if uh, there exists an embedded disjoint union of handle bodies, H equals H1, uh, H2, union H N with the boundary of H Okay. So, so what does it mean for a surface link to be unknotted or unlinked? Um, it means that we can find, it means that the surface link bounds a handle body. And an embedded disjoint union of handle bodies, this should be in S4. Such that the boundary. Okay, so consider as the boundary of a three-dimensional neighborhood of the wedges, even the three-dimensional wedges of wedges of this. Okay. So let's put this in context a little bit. Orientable surface link is unlinked. Mm -hmm. I guess we don't, maybe I should also say that, so maybe I'll call it, it um, call it the unlink. Um, 
if and only if. S can vulnerable surface link. S is unlinked if and only if S can be isotoped to lie in S3. Say the equatorial S3. Um, moreover, any two um, unlinked surface links. Yeah. Yeah. Of the same type. Uh, and by isotopic, I mean ambient isotopic. Okay, so this this is actually, I mean, this, um, let's see. So, um, I, I think I might uh, post on proving this until we talk a little bit more about handle bodies and compression systems with disks and things like that. Um, but uh, I would encourage you to maybe think about how we might how how you might show this is true, and as an ex a similar exercise um, is to give examples of surfaces that are uh, that are non-isotopic in S three. But I guess necessarily become isotopic when considered a candid isotope in S4. And I guess the question is can this be done for any genus? Or I guess any homeomorphism type? So they're embedded in, in S3 from the start? Right. Okay. Yeah, surfaces. And yeah, I guess they start off in S3 would, would be one way. Or you basically take a surface link and push it into S3 in different ways. But it, so that it's. That would be sort of, that's sort of the same. It's sort of the same. Thing. So think about this, is, this is still our handle, yeah. Um, Okay, we're doing this thing. Okay, great. Anybody have any questions so far? So this is we'll talk about an oriented, an unknowing orientable surface line. And this is sort of the, that explains the connection that it has to. So is it in pictures that have eights or would so if I if I just imagine the Xenos 3 surface and uh, I have this picture in mind, is this something naughty? Like I take the hands and I knot them together. Is this or this is unknotted and I have a totally wrong picture? You think of this, I think? Yes. Yeah. So this is genus two. Genus two. Genus two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So what? Well, what is the what is the right question to ask about this guy? It's an investment part of it sitting inside. That's your question, right? Yeah, so I think the question is what's the right question? No, the question is, is it not it? Is it not it as a as a surface in in S4? So this is in S3 and we include an S3 with an S4. Well so this bounds the handlebar. 
and it bounds a handle by so S bounds a handle by actually in, in three dimensional space. So it is the boundary of S is the boundary of a handle body in three space, so it's certainly the boundary of a handle body in four space. So it is definitely not. That's right. So and so the your question might be about believing the proposition. Does anyone want to believe that it's isotopic or expanded? Right. So now, now there's now there's the question of whether this is isotopic to this, and then the, the extra dimension. Pardon? And there I need the extra dimension. Well, that's now that is the actual question. And the, for this example, the interesting question is: Do I need the extra dimension? Um, by that proposition, you can certainly do an extra dimension. But in fact, this can be achieved inside. Oh yes, it's, I, I can see that. Right. So said differently, the exterior, if we call this thing H, right? The exterior of H is um, is an animal. Just like this one. Exterior size. Okay. okay, so there's no good picture, but I should have. Well, this is a good picture. <laughs> no, no, you want a good, a good cha challenging picture. Oh, a challenging. Yeah, you need to work harder than this. <laughs> <laughs> so what we need to see is a surface that doesn't have an S3 that doesn't have a handle body on either side in S3, but still then see that you really do need the extra dimensions. And if you allow yourself to go into L S4, you can still basically get isotopic to a standard one. But you, you can take the boundary of to the neighborhood of a nine, and that in S3 won't, won't be isotopic to a standard right. torus. And that's the next simplest example. Okay, I mean, that's just that's just direct. Oh. Pardon. It's not the tripod because it's sideways this time. Um, okay, so you take a regular neighborhood of it. Well, it bounds a handle body, right? So it is unknotted. So this surface is unknotted, even by some uh, it even bounds a solid force in the three sphere, but you're but you're right that in this case the the exterior of H is not equal to non-unlocked. It's the trap, you know, we may know it has some interesting fundamental group, right? The fundamental group of a handle body is free. It's in the neighborhood of a wedge of circles. This guy's interesting group. Um, but if you do this, and now the exterior is a handle body. Oh, magic. But even if you don't do that, you can nice to the standard torus if you use Okay. Yeah, so we're so try to do that exercise. It's it's fine. I mean this you were close. We were close with the with the regular neighborhood of the trap oil, because it, it didn't bound the one side, but it did. Now somehow we have to screw up the other side. Um, and then yeah, so let's think about the proposition. Okay, so one direction of the proposition is really easy, so maybe we should talk about that. Which direction of the proposition is easy? Right, easy, I mean, like it will seem easy once it's explained. <laughs> Not right. <laughs> um, so, if a orientable surface link is in, then it's, it bounds a collection of handle bodies, which are just these regular handles of these bouquets, 
but the bouquet themselves can be isotoped to the lion S3. And along with them, their regular neighborhood can be brought into S3. So the boundary of that regular neighborhood can be brought in. Not entirely trivial, trivial either. But I mean, yeah. it, to, to there being no. Well, no fun, I mean, you can use an exercise. Okay, some of them. Okay. Well, we're um, we're finished with time for the day, so we'll talk about non-R animals surface.